So, <clears throat> what I want to look at here, number six, is I want to start to then look at this ceteris paribus assumption. And then connected to that, I want to look at number seven, which is going to distinguish shifts from movements. So in distinguishing shifts from movements, what we're seeing here is that let's draw, let's start by drawing out both the um, supply curve and demand curve again in terms of the function. That demand was a function of the price of the product, income, tastes and preferences, population, price of related goods, and prices expected in the future. And then, for supply, that supply was a function of the price, costs and technology, number of firms, taxes and subsidies, and prices expected in the future. So the idea here is that for the law of demand, as we saw it, we said that as the price falls, the quantity demanded increases. Law of supply is essentially saying that as the price falls, the quantity supplied falls. And vice versa, that as the price goes up, the quantity demanded falls. That as the price goes up, the quantity supplied goes up. Those are explaining again our movements along the curve. Let's look at what each of these looks like. Here's again our P and Q. And that for the demand curve, that as the price is falling, I am moving along the curve. But the curve itself is staying the same. And then over here, still staying with a static demand curve, but now I'm moving to the left along the curve, and I'm seeing now a decrease in the quantity as the price goes up. Again, a movement along a static curve. Over here, here's now my supply curve, and as the price goes down, the quantity supplied decreases. Again, Q subscript, subscript D refers to quantity demanded, the points along the curve. Q subscript S is referring to quantity supplied, the points along the curve. And now what I have going on here is that as the price goes up, the quantity supplied goes up. Now, <coughs> you'll notice here, price, 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 that's only referring to this first variable in the entire function. So the question then naturally comes about what happens when we change the other variables? Like what do we expect um, could happen to these um, functions? And what happens is that if I change anything else other than the price itself, it then causes a shifting of the curve. What that's called is relaxing the ceteris paribus assumption. Let's talk about what ceteris paribus means. Ceteris paribus is Latin, and it basically means all other things constant. 
So essentially what we're seeing here with the law of demand and with the law of supply is that we're adjusting only the price. All of these other things are staying the same. So essentially with the law of demand, we need to add to both of them the assumption of ceteris paribus and ceteris paribus. Because essentially, again, by adding ceteris paribus to each of these laws of demand and supply, we're seeing that all of these other things do not change. Now, what we obviously can see, though, is that that's not realistic. That oftentimes in the world, these other things do change. So then what we need to do is we actually need to look at then how the curves shift. So what we saw here were movements along the curve. These are movements, a movement to the right along the curve, a movement to the left along the curve, a movement to the left along the curve, a movement to the right along the curve. So now what we want to do is shift the curve. So as we start to think about how we shift the curve, let's just talk about the different possible ways we could shift the curve. Um, the different possible ways we could shift the curve is that we could shift the demand mm -hmm. to the right. we could shift the demand to the left. We could shift the supply to the left. And we could shift the um, supply to the right. So this would be, this is what we would refer to as an increase in demand. This would be referred to as a decrease in demand. This would be referred to as a decrease in supply. And this would be referred to as a increase in supply. Do you see how, for a shift, how those graphs look different than movements? How do we represent them with letters? This is demand goes up. This is demand goes down. This is supply goes down. This is supply goes up. Do you see how those four circles, demand going up, demand going down, is different from quantity demanded going up and quantity demanded going down? These two pictures mm -hmm look different than these two pictures. And that's why we have to be quite particular about how we refer to things as either demand or quantity demanded. Because if you don't do that, if you just say demand is changing, demand is going up or demand is going down, in my head, I'm thinking these things. When in fact, you may be meaning these things. And they're obviously quite different. So you need to be careful in your choice of words of demand and quantity demanded. These are quantity demanded. Movements along the curve caused by a changing in the price. These, these are demand shifting, demand increasing or decreasing. And the shift is happening The 
shift is occurring because I'm relaxing the setter's paribus assumption, meaning I'm allowing these other variables to change. So let's look at, for each of these, what that looks like. So let's, um, I'm going to do, um, well, let's just deal with them each in turn. Let's first focus on what could cause demand to shift. And let's deal first with income. So we know that consumers, that their income obviously changes. But there are actually two kinds of goods we need to think about. We need to think about those goods which are normal and those goods which are inferior. So there are a number of goods where we buy more of the product as we um, get more and more income. And in those kinds of cases, those are normal goods. Some 80% of goods are normal goods. Boats, houses, cars, <laughs> food, um, you know, most things. Like, right, what if you just get a really big check? What would you buy more if you'd buy more of these normal goods? And conversely, you would buy less when income falls. So if you lost your job or something happened where your income did go down, then um, you probably would buy less. Um, and so what does that essentially look like? Um, what that looks like here for normal good, so I would have to identify for you that it is a normal good, is that if the income is increasing, what we know is that the demand will go up. And the way that that looks, I'm going to refer to D1 as our first demand curve, is that it will shift out. That's our demand increasing. Now, it'll move, so this would be from D1 to D2. Now, what about buying less when our income falls? That's going to be, let's say, our movement from D1 to D3. And that would be when income falls, demand falls. Still a normal good, but basically, if I lose my job, then I'll consume less of whatever this product is. For an inferior good, it works in the opposite direction. So some goods are inferior goods. What it means to be an inferior good is that you actually buy more when your income falls. And you buy less when your income goes up. So what would be examples of those kinds of products? Well, that would be things like, um, for instance, what would happen uh, if you lost your job? Would you ride the bus more often or less often? You probably would ride the bus more often. And um, because, right, those kinds of goods are, are things that you don't, you don't generally like to ride the bus if you don't have to. So because of that, we could have the same thing happening here. Income going up. But because it is an inferior good, my demand will fall. So basically I'm going to ride the bus less. So here's my original demand curve, that as I get this new job, I'm not going to ride the bus as often. So that's going to be my D1 to D2. I'm sorry, um, I'm sorry, not this. this. D1 to 
to D2. Alternatively, I could go to D3, and what would that look like? That would say that my income is going down, then my demand will go up. If I lose my job, I'm going to ride the bus more often. I'm going to buy the store brand of um, uh, food items. Um, I'm going to um, eat more frozen pizza. These are examples of inferior goods, things you do basically when you're poor. And if you're no longer poor, you probably will stop doing those things. So this would be D1 to D3. So that deals with our very first variable here, income. Now let's deal with the second variable, taste and preferences. Basically, taste and preferences refer to the fact of whether you want this product or not. Um, this is a rather simple one. Basically, um, like how, why do tastes and preferences change? Tastes and preferences can change because, you know, it's either a fad, right? It's a more popular item, or it could change in the opposite direction, where now all of a sudden no one wants the product, um, because maybe a study comes out that says it's unhealthy or something along those lines, and that basically in that market. that if for whatever reason something becomes more popular or everyone decides that now they want to buy this thing, the demand will shift to the right. The thing will become more popular. If it becomes less popular, then my demand curve will shift um, instead to the left. What about population? Also, a rather simple one here. where essentially if I have more people, it looks like this, where the demand is shifting to the right. This would be an increase in demand. Right? This is demand going up. This is demand going up. This is demand going down. This would be my demand going down. Then I have my price of related goods. And in my price of related goods, what we see here. deal with this with phones. There are basically two types of relationships that exist. And essentially what we're saying here is that goods can either be substitutes And substitute goods were, are goods that can be used instead. So it'd be something like oranges and clementines, right? Like uh, if I just want a citrus fruit and I like oranges a lot, but let's say the oranges weren't available or were too expensive, I might be willing to um, just uh, eat a clementine instead.
And then we have complements. This is complements with an E. And these are products that are used together. So for instance, whenever I eat pizza at Pizza Hut, I always like to get the breadsticks. So the price of breadsticks is going to matter to how much pizza I want to eat. Just as the price of oranges is going to affect how many clementines I eat. Now what matters though is whether they are substitutes to each other or complements and how that price of that alternative good is changing. So let's stick with our phones product here and let's try to come up with substitutes and complements. So a substitute to a phone, well, let's say with a cell phone, a substitute to a cell phone would obviously be like a landline, right? So let's just specify this further and just call it a mobile phone. And what we're seeing here is that a landline phone is a substitute product. Right? I mean, yeah, it's not exactly a substitute because you probably would be grumpy to have to use that kind of thing. But uh, you'd be grumpy to have to use a landline phone. But for the most part, right, if you just have to call people, the two products work pretty similarly. Um... And then if we want to look at a complement good, this would be like a, a cell phone case. Right? Because when you buy a cell phone, typically you don't just use your cell phone um, raw, right? You usually you, know, you buy an OtterBox for it or you know you buy some some case for the phone itself. Now let's say that the price of landline service goes up. What do we know happens already? We know from the law of demand that if the price of landline service goes up, that the quantity demanded So if the price of landline service again goes up, then the quantity demanded, we know, will fall. This would be for the landline service. We know that from the law of demand. But then here's the thing. If fewer people are buying landline services, yet they still need to make phone calls, what we know is that the demand for cell phones is going to go up. Because essentially they're saying that the other thing that I could buy instead of cell phones, this is cell, not all phones, the other thing they could buy instead of cell phones are landlines. But landline phones are more expensive, so they're going to start to buy cell phones. So what's happening here is that in the landline market, where I have P and Q, what we're seeing here is a movement along the curve for landlines, but for cell phones, what we're seeing here is a shifting of the curve. See how both of those things are happening? Here in landline, it was the price of the service itself that was changing. In the cell phone market, the entire demand curve is shifting because this is shifting not because the price of cell phones changed, rather the price of, in this case, the substitute good was changing. So this is the situation for a substitute. For a complement, then what we're seeing here is like the price, I'll use the formal name here, right? OtterBox would be like a cell phone case. In the case of a um, OtterBox case, if the thing that you buy with a phone is always a case, if the price of cases are going up, 
then the quantity demanded is falling. Same as before. Again, we know this from the law of demand. But, again, when we go to cell phones, people buy cases and phones together. But now fewer people are buying cases, then fewer people are going to buy phones because they buy the two together. Again, to draw the comparison here, here's my OtterBox cases for my phone. Same movement up along the curve, but now for cell phones, fewer people are buying cell phones because the thing they buy with cell phones is becoming more expensive in price. Okay, last one. I'm going to try to squeeze it here on the bottom of the page here because it's actually not too difficult. Price expected in the future. Basically, when we're buying something, we're generally trying to anticipate what it might possibly cost in the future. If we expect that the price is going to go up in the future, we might try to born, buy more now, right? We might stock up. So essentially, if the price is expected to rise, Then in the market for cell phones, people will buy more now because they think the price is going to go up. <coughs> now this is important because here we're talking about price expectations. We're not talking about the price of the good itself. We're, thinking, we're talking about our expectation of how the price might change. If the price were expected to fall, And people probably will wait to buy the product, meaning that people will buy less right now because they're going to wait until the good becomes cheaper. Now, let's talk about this with respect to the supply curve. <coughs> For the supply curve, Again, what we had was that supply was a function of, again, price, cost technology, number of firms, taxes, subsidies. Price is expected. <coughs> and again, the issue is going to be that the price of the good itself is going to cause the movement along the curve, and that any of the other variables changing is going to cause a shift of the curve. So what we're going to need to look at here is Again, if it's just this thing changing, that's going to be my movement along the curve if the price is going up, or alternatively, the price is going down. That's my movement. Let's deal now with each of these variables cost and technology. So basically the firm we're asking here is what would happen if the firm had to pay more money uh, for the <coughs> the resource <coughs> for the resources it uses to build the product. Well most firms right are going to react to that by producing uh, less of the product right because they're going to um, basically say if I have to charge the same price, um, it doesn't make sense for me to um, 
it doesn't make sense for me to build a lot if my costs are increasing, right? Because I'm kind of losing money now, at least a little bit. So the idea is that when costs go up or when technology gets worse. Now, this seems a little odd to say that. So let me explain how technology could get worse. Technology could get worse. It's not because we like forget like how to do something or you know we're actively destroying computers or or whatever. It's not like that. Here, what we're saying is that sometimes the government gets involved because they think that um, they think that the technology um, isn't good socially. So, for instance, here in um, here in Hawaii, um, we don't, uh, for at least a period of time, we didn't allow Uber to be used um, at the airport uh, here in town. Um, so uh, basically, that government limitation made it so that it was more costly to do business because you couldn't use the Uber app to like get transportation. Um, so that would be a way that technology gets worse. Costs could go up. That would be examples like uh, what if the minimum wage goes up or what if oil prices go up, gasoline prices go up. <coughs> In the cell phone market, this would be things like what if the price of plastic goes up or the price of glass goes up. These would all be things that cause a decrease in the supply curve. And that looks like the supply curve shifting to the left. So this is supply going down from S1 to S2. Alternatively, costs could go down. Wages go down. Uh, resources go, price of resources go down. Or the technology gets better. And um, these would all be <coughs> examples where the supply curve increases. Number of firms. This is rather similar to the population story that we told with... Um, the demand curve. And if the number of firms goes up, then what we simply see here is that this supply curve will increase. And if the number of firms fall, we would see a decrease in supply. Taxes and subsidies. Is that for taxes and subsidies? If taxes, taxes are what we pay to the government, if taxes go up or subsidies. Subsidy is when you get money for the government for doing something. Like, you know, doing something good, like, I don't know, fighting pollution, or if you're a company, if you, like, you know, give things to, like, homeless people or help, you know, impoverished people. Generally, the government tries to encourage you to do those things. In this case, uh, actually, this would be an example for cell phones. For cell phones, um, you might notice that sometimes people get free cell phones for, like, um, you know, if they're collecting, like, Social Security disability payments or um, they're homeless, maybe they would get a donation of a free cell phone or something like that. Well, what if all of a sudden the government cut that subsidy or they um, increase the taxes that cell phone companies have to pay? Generally, what would happen is that the supply curve would decrease. Alternatively, the supply curve would increase, in cell phones, 
if the taxes were going down or the subsidy was going up. And then finally we have the prices expected in the future. And for the price expected in the future here is that if firms expect a higher future price, if firms expect a higher future price, then they'll probably try to hold off some of their production. So their current production, the supply will go down because they're going to want to wait to sell it until that future period of time. On the other hand, if firms expect prices to fall, then they're going to try to flood the market with the stuff before the price does actually fall. Okay, so what we see here then on these pages are both the supply curve shifting and the demand curve shifting, and hopefully you can clearly see how that's different than moving along the curve. <sighs>